Hello, everyone. Uh, we would like to welcome you to another episode of Sierra Media. And uh, today we are really excited uh, to have this long awaited um, uh, interview with our dear brother, Dr. Jay Smith. Many of you know him, of course. Um, this is He's the guy who, uh, at the Speaker's Corner, has been doing this for 25 years. You probably have watched him do this on many YouTube videos. But he also uh, represents uh, two fabulous ministries. One is the Funder Center for Apologetics, and the other one is I Squared. And also, uh, Jay, uh, as we know him, but now he is Dr. Jay Smith. Congratulations, by mm -hmm. the way, on your PhD. Um, is an apologist and a polemist also in the field of Islam. So, Jay, why don't you explain the difference between being an apologist and a polemist at the same time? Listen, thanks for having me on the show. It's great to finally be with you, Al Fadi, and we're going to talk more about why we're here and what we're going to do. But let's start with these two words because most people probably don't know what they mean. That's right. Uh, and it's, it's, I always like to look at a football team, an American football team you know, here. Uh, in America, you have really two teams on every team, don't you? That's correct. You yeah. have a defensive team an and you have an offense. And they have really different skills. The defense uh, have to make sure that the other team doesn't score against them. And so they have big brutes of guys and they, they, they know all the defensive moves. They know all, what they're, all, the, all the offensive moves. They know how, how to put a defense against that. In, uh, when we're talking about Christianity and Islam, the defense would be apologetic. So you have the apologetics in Christianity against the attacks coming in from Islam. Muslims also have an apologetics. Their apologetics is very weak, as you're going to find out today. They don't have much apologetics. In fact, there aren't any schools of apologetics that I'm aware of in Islam. The main reason is because we haven't done a good job of taking them on. Because that's the other side. That's the other team. The other team would be the ones that the offensive team, the ones that go on the offense, to go and score against the opposing side. And remember, in American football, it tends to be the offense that is the most popular. Uh, they that's are the right. players that are paid the most. That's right. That's right. Offense yeah. would be polemics when we're talking about Correct. Islam and Christianity. Islam is brilliant when it comes to polemics. In fact, I would suggest that they are the best when it comes to polemics because so? this book right here is one big polemical book. The whole Quran is full of polemics. It attacks the kafir, it attacks the pagans, it attacks the idolaters, it attacks the Jews, it attacks the Christians, you name it. Yeah, it chapter it. five uh, alone is a polemics against the Trinity. Huge for polemics. Yeah. Yeah. And because of that, Muslims have no fear of going on the attack when it comes, well, I'm not saying physical attack, I'm talking verbal attack, confronting the person of Jesus Christ. That's confronting right. the Trinity. Because they have confidence in Absolutely. what they believe in. And we spend all our time defending against all these. And if you look at many of the debates in the past, though, in the last, maybe last 30 years with Islam and Christianity, almost every debate has been against Christianity. Rarely is there a debate against Islam. We introduced that uh, primarily in the 1990s uh, because there was such a dearth of examples of that. And That's we true. said, hold on a minute, the best defense... Uh, Vince Lombardi, he, I don't know if you know that he was an American coach here. Uh, Vince Lombardi says the best defense is a good offense. You need to go on the offense and make sure that the opposing team is on the defense. And we weren't doing that in Christianity. We didn't know how to do that. There is no school to train you in that. And I noticed that, that sometimes uh, the church in general and uh, believers in particular, uh, they, they feel nervous about the idea of going on the offense as if uh, they assume maybe that it's not a biblical concept. This has been drummed into our heads, yeah. Al, especially in Europe and also here in the United States, that this is not Christ-like. Christ never went on the offense. Christ, if you look at the Christian, the Christian Christ that we have created in Europe and in the United States, he always walks in slow motion, always has a smile on his face, has blue eyes and blonde hair, never raises his voice. We have, really, we have Europeanized Christ. So I wonder, what is their answer, for instance, for the Matthew 23 and his attack on the Pharisees? Well, that's just why we one need guys example. like you. Yeah. We need people that come from the Middle East. We need Muslims who have come out of Islam, are well-versed in polemics, know exactly how to use it, how to employ it, and know the best strategies for using it, who have now come to the Lord, like you. You're a Saul who's become a Paul. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just explain what I mean. When God met Saul... In a, uh, on the way to Damascus, he chose Saul for a reason because Saul was, well, he was one of the top of his, of his, uh, of his day. Uh, he was one of the greatest Jews of his time. He identified himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. And more than that, he yeah. was very much of a polemicist. 
He was there holding the clothes of the men that were stoning Stephen. He was on his way to Damascus to bring the Christians in chains. Mm -hmm. That's polemics. That's on the attack. That's going on the offensive. And God met him in a dynamic way and made him from Saul into Paul. And, and now, we, you were a Saul, weren't you? We, we praise the Lord uh, for his uh, grace, and we thank the Lord also for ministries like yours because I remember also watching you and uh, being encouraged by, uh, you know, I want to call it bravery, but uh, boldness. It's really, that's what the book of Acts talk about. It's the boldness of the believers, how the church increased and grew. It's not fear that allowed the church to grow. And that's why we're here today. Uh, yeah. We are going to be talking about some sensitive topics that many of my Muslim people, as a former Muslim who even grew up in the heartland of Islam, Saudi Arabia, uh, who came up with uh, my own presuppositions about what Islam is and what Christianity is, all of a sudden now, as a believer, I'm discovering that there is more to the story of Islam than meets the eye. And uh, every day, almost, there is a new discovery related to archaeological discoveries or historical evidence to support the idea that what Muslims know about Islam is really not the reality of what academia is discovering. And one of these hot topics is obviously the Quran, and it's, I like what you call it, it's many problems, actually. So uh, give us a quick idea about what are the areas that we are going to go through uh, in these multi, uh, basically, episodes here. Right. And, and what we, we need to do, and, and, and I, we need to tell, make sure people understand, and if there are Muslims who are watching this, I'm speaking to you specifically, Muslims, what we're going to be doing, Al and I, we are going to be using polemics. This is a polemical show. These are going to be highly confrontational. They're going to be very controversial. They are going to destroy many of your paradigms. We're going to be a, a confronting this show, these episodes, the Quran. We, could, we will be going into Muhammad later. But for this show, we're going to be cutting, confronting the Quran. Now, why are we doing this out? Well, the reason is very simple. Islam really stands or falls with only two pillars. There's only two pillars that hold up Islam. One man named Muhammad and one book called the Quran. That's where they have the book and the man. The book and the man. That's my phrase, and I've been using it for years. Yeah. Without that book and without that man, there is no Islam. Correct. And we have found in uh, working at Speaker's Corner for 25 years, we have found that if you zero your confrontation, not on Muslims, we're not here to confront Muslims. And I need to repeat that. We're not here to confront Muslims. We're here Absolutely. to confront one man and one book. One man Absolutely. in one book, and I would add a third, one God. But for these episodes, we're going to confront that book, the Quran. Correct. Correct. And the reason why is because there's some new material. As you mentioned, there is some new historical material that's coming to the fore uh, that, my goodness, this is exciting. I have never had this kind of material. In the 35 years I've been working with Islam, 25 years in London, we never had what we're going to share today. Absolutely, and it was an eye-opener even for me coming from that background when I became aware of these discoveries and especially some of the research that you've done. And you, by the way, uh, many uh, sometimes Muslims attack you and think that you're fabricating things. You uh, basically quote every single source. Yeah. You give them the sources to go to. And that's the problem with Islamic apologetics. It's emotional more so than factual. And we want to help a lot of our Muslim audience, hopefully, to take the time to go and investigate for themselves. Many of these information are readily available these days. And, and I want to support that. And let's, I want to repeat what you've just said. It's so important to realize that what we're going to be doing today is not my research. This is not your research. That's correct. This that's is correct. research that's been done by experts. These are Islamicists. Uh, these are scholars. We're going to be quoting from them. That's we're correct. going to be using their material. Our job today is basically to communicate that. We are the messengers. We are the Amen. mouthpiece for these researchers. Now, in saying that, and this is a real problem, this area of research uniquely is the only area of research that can kill you for what you're saying. For that How reason, so? even the scholars that we're quoting cannot say what we're saying, dare not say what we're saying. They will do the research, and many of them are funneling the material onto us so that we can bring it back to the masses. Because out of to the, the danger public. involved. It in, is dangerous. And definitely, this is hot material that uh, no Muslim have ever heard of. And the ones that have heard of it, people like Salman Rushdie. Look what happened to Salman Rushdie under house arrest for 10 years. That's right. They tried to kill him. They wanted, he had a fatwa on his head. Taslim al Nasrin. Uh, look at uh, Sahih Hussein. Look at um, all these names. These They just Correct. drip out of your mouth. These are people who have had Fazlu Rahman, who had to flee from uh, Bangladesh, or Pakistan, excuse me, and move and spend the rest of his time in 
United States. And just look at what mm -hmm. happened with the, the Muhammad cartoons. That's right. That's uh, right. There in That's Denmark, right. and or Charlie Hebdo cartoons in Paris. Those who actually created those cartoons were killed for it. For that reason, scholars don't want to go public with what they're researching. But uh, I want to say it will be a sin for me and you to hoard this material and know these facts and not share it with people that they ought to be aware of it. And that's why I thank you for your courage and thank you for being here on the show so well, listen, we will is, be able to do this. This is going to be fun uh, because I've been waiting to do this for you. And I think I hope people are, I hope really the people are watching what's going to be happening. And let me just say, the reason I did, agreed to do this with Al uh, or Abdul Fadi, and the reason why I did do this because we're for the first time, I finally have a man who is next to me who has actually been there. You were a Muslim. That's right. You were a Salafi. You That's were, right. uh, this, uh, you are Saudi Arabian. Yeah. Arabic is your mother tongue. That's right. But yeah. not only is Arabic your mother tongue, you understand Quranic Arabic. Now right. explain that to the people, what I mean by that. Well, I mean, Quranic Arabic obviously is archaic Arabic, and you have to really know how to pronounce it correctly, understand what it means, but also go to the primary sources that even elaborate further, like the tafsir, for instance. Not a whole lot of Muslims, by the way, have access to these things. And as you know, majority of Muslims don't even speak Arabic. So even when they learn to speak Arabic, they learn it just for ritual purposes and not to really understand it at a deeper level. This is going to be fun. I'll tell you why. Because I get hammered with this all the time. Jay, you're not an Arabist. You don't know Arabic. Well, I do. I can read and write it. I had to learn it. I Many had two years on learn it. Arabic, but yeah. I am not a scholar of Arabic like you are. I am not a man who speaks it as his mother tongue like you do. I have not the background in Arabic like you have had. So that's why it's going to be so much fun having somebody who's a scholar next to me. But you're not just an Arabist. You are also a polemicist. In fact, you're going to be doing a doctorate in this area. This is going to be the, this is going to be the foundation of your doctoral thesis, what we're doing today. So this is going to be exciting because this is just the first stage of what will be many stages. Amen. And we're going to be coming back and unpacking even more material as the years go by, as you start to pre primarily go into the manuscript evidence. And we'll be talking more about that in the episodes as they come up. That's, that's true. And since this is going to be a really uh, long, uh, basically, list of information, before we wrap up this first episode, let's give people a uh, basically a glimpse of what we are going to go through. Well, we're going to go through six areas. And uh, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to unpack, but let's just, for before we do it, let's just look at, at what the claims are. To do that, we need to ask, what is it that Muslims are saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and if we put the slide up there, you can see the immunability of the Quran. This is what Muslims claim. They claim that there is no error, that the Quran is unique in the world. Correct. It is the only book the only revelation that goes right back to the very beginning. It's the only one that can make that claim. That, that, uh, for 35 years, I've heard this over and over again. The Bible doesn't have its original manuscripts. Correct. It's been corrupted along the way. Uh, we don't even know who the authors are. Who's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? They're not. They are not prophets. Where is, is Jesus' Bible? Where is his, his New Testament? Uh, yeah, that's but correct. the Quran, they say, is the only one that doesn't have these problems. It's not corrupted. And the claims they make are these four that you see up on the screen there. And I want to look at this slide here. And people can see it, of course. The first one is that the Quran is uncreated. That it has always existed eternally. Uh, on these clay tablets that some, uh, somehow exist in heaven, we find that in uh, Surah 85, Ayah 22. Now, when we say Surah, Ayah, we mean chapter, chapter or and book verse. and yep. verse, book and verse. That's the first claim. So it's uncreated. Number two is that this Quran was sent down to a man named Muhammad over a period of 22 years, from 610 to 632. That's the second claim. Third claim is that it was, though it was not written down completely, in fact, it wasn't written down. We'll get into that as to why it wasn't written down in future episodes. It wasn't right. written down uh, before Muhammad died. It had to be first written down during the time of Abu Bakr, between correct. 632 to 634. That's the first recension. That's correct. And then a second recension, a second uh, Quran, had to be in rewritten Uthman. about 20 years later during the time of Uthman. Right. So it was finalized at the time of Uthman. It was canonized at the time of Uthman. That's the third claim. And then the fourth claim is that that Quran that was finalized at the time of Uthman, so 1,400 years ago, is absolutely the same today, unchanged. 
And we're going to get into that. In fact, it might be good if we uh, ask, first of all, do we even say this about our Bible? Because Muslims say, oh, you got the same problem. Because what you describe is exactly how I grew up, what every Muslim thinks. But let's look, look at the slide and see. Yeah. What do Christians claim? Well, first of all, was the Bible created? Uh, the Bible was created. We know that it is not an eternal book. Uh, we know when it was created. We know the dates but it was we created. Mean the Word of God is eternal. The However, Word of God is the eternal. The Bible as a book. But the Bible is a book. See, that's why we need to make sure that exactly. we're defining terms. Exactly. Muslims think that when we're saying their revelation, the Word of God, that they're, we're saying the same thing they're saying. No, we don't say the same thing. That's we're correct. not making the same claims. I would never sit here and say that the, the Bible is eternal. Because, <laughs> listen, I know Moses lived in uh, 3,400 years ago in 1400 B.C. He wrote the first five books. That's right. We know who wrote them. So... Sent down? No, it was not sent down to Moses. There was no angel that that uh, that gave it to him like we have with the Quranic revelations, right. starting in the Hira cave. No, that didn't exist. What we do know is that every man who wrote it, it's about 33 different authors, and every man that did write it was inspired by God. But this was not a book that was sent down already pre-packaged and given to each one of those authors. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each wrote four different testimonies of the life and sayings of Jesus Christ. And each one wrote it differently. And each one wrote it using right. his own capacity and his own, uh, they even, even their own speciality, but also they had a different reason for writing it. So that's why we have to be careful that we're not claiming what the Muslims claim. That's true. And also Second Peter 1, uh, basically 18 to 21 says that holy men of God were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's God who spoke through them and used the uh, common language of the day. For instance, one of the things that I use all the time is like, why did the Quran come in in Arabic to a small group of people if God really, the God of Islam, wanted this message to be to all nations? Well, we're going to get into that. Yeah, Hold absolutely. on to that question. That's yeah. a great question. And we're going to ask Muslims specifically that question. But let's get, we'll come to that. The, yeah. the, the fourth claim then, um, or I mean, the third claim, was it complete? Yes, it was complete in its original form. We, we don't make it, we don't, we don't uh, make any bones about that. Of course it was complete. Right. But number four, has it changed? Yes, it has changed. And by the way, Muslims pick on you when you say this. You might want to clarify to them what you mean by that. Oh, I know exactly what I mean by that. Yeah. If you look at the Bible, if in my NIV, and I have an NIV right here, and you open it up to Mark uh, chapter 16. That's right. And you look at verse 9 to or 22. Or John 8. John chapter 7, verse 53 to John 8, 11. That's right. Or 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Those are the three main areas. In my new NIV, there's a line before and after. So right there at Mark 16, there's a line that warns the reader in a footnote that these verses are not found in, in earlier manuscripts. the earliest manuscripts, in That's the right. Greek manuscripts. Yeah. That's not to say that they weren't there. I'm not going to get into that debate here. But we are very clear. We're very transparent. We warn the reader, be careful that these verses are not found in the Greek manuscripts. And you know what I find funny, by the way, is how did the Muslims know about this if it wasn't for us giving him that hint in the Bible? So we don't make the claim that these are the that we have the original man. We do not have the original. And if we take these parts out, is it going to change the message that we're saved by faith yeah. by grace? If you look at the forty verses that we're talking about, mm -hmm. there's not one doctrine that's there that's not found elsewhere. So it doesn't change the doctrines. It doesn't change the scripture. But we are the great thing about it is you and I are sitting here as Christians, and we're admitting yes, there have been changes. What we're going to show is that this exact same problem exists for Islam and exists exactly. for the Quran, but even greater than the Bible. Absolutely, so, because it affects a lot of things. Some absolutely. of these changes are theological in nature. And that's, that's why we're asking Muslims, before you make this claim that the Quran is inimitable, before you make this claim that it is eternal or sent down or that it is uh, compiled at uh, 1,400 years ago or that it's unchanged, yeah. before you say that, Listen to what we're saying. And I hope by the end of these episodes, no more will we hear Muslims making those claims again. So, Dr. J, I know uh, we are going to go through a number of areas that relates to the Quran and its problems. And I believe you compiled a list that we looked at, and we are going to analyze and critique each uh, area of the uh, in this list. And I think it's about five or six different areas. Can you share more about this with our audience? Absolutely. Let's go back to the slides itself. And as you look at the slide, you will see up there the six areas that we are going to observe. We're going to start with the two compilations, uh, the two recensions, uh, the Abu Bakr, compilation and the, and the Uthman. Uthmanic. Those yep. are the two compilations. So we'll unpack that as to why there are two and Correct. show some real damaging um, questions concerning that. Number two, we're going to look at the six earliest manuscripts of the Quran. These are the six ones that we are introduced 
in 2014 in a debate I did with Dr. Shabirati and are still used as the six major archaic manuscripts. Then we're going to look into changes to these earliest manuscripts, looking at Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Brubaker's material. Uh, then we'll move into the two layers of the Son of so zeroing in probably the most damaging manuscript, then the oldest of the manuscripts, uh, the Palimpsest, the two layers. Uh, Palimpsest means uh, different layers of writings. That's right. And we'll move from there into the carbon dating lab reports, uh, the claim that this Birmingham folio is the oldest Quran. We're going to confront that. Uh, show you some new uh, research that's come out of these laboratories. And then we'll finish with the 31 different Arabic Qurans and ask the question concerning the Kirat and the Akhruf uh, difficulties. Right. So those are the six areas that we're going to zero in, in on these episodes. Wonderful. Well, um, uh, hopefully our audience uh, and viewers in this case will enjoy um, these different areas. And some of them, by the way, I believe they're going to be long enough to where we might even split them into different parts. Or some of them will have parts. to do more than one episode because there's just so much material, especially I think when we get to the six manager and especially when we get to the top copy, which is going to be your expertise. That's uh, something we're looking forward to right now. And uh, we want to thank uh, everyone for uh, watching this episode. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll tune in for the next episode, uh, which is a continuation of this particular uh, dialogue that is taking place. And also we will begin next time by talking about the two compilation of the Quran. And we'll kick off this particular uh, Quranic problem series from there. Dr. J, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash Sierra International.